Hey guys, we are back for the second episode of our mini series on all things cap tables. Carlos, great to have you back. Thanks once again for doing this with me. I am so excited about the second episode, some really cool concepts and ready to fire up. Exactly. So in the last episode, we walked through the very basics of setting up your cap table. And we also modeled a very simple angel round or a friends and family round. And if you haven't checked it out, it's worth doing just purely because um, we're going to be picking up from where we left off and we're going to be building upon some of those concepts that, that we talked about. So in this episode specifically, we are going to be walking you through your first VC-led round. So it's an institutional round and it's just going to be a very simple equity round. So we're not going to talk anything to do with convertibles or safes or ASAs. That'll all um, come in the next episode, so stay tuned for that. But in this round, several things are going to happen. And these are all really common things that happen, so it's just worth understanding as a founder how they all work and how you model them up. So it's four, four key things. So firstly, your existing investors that, we, that, that you brought on in the last round are going to be asking for their pro writers. So what is that and how do you calculate that? Secondly, the new investors that you're going to be bringing on might well be asking for a different type of share. So that could be, for example, a preferred share where they have certain rights. So what is that? How do you illustrate that? Thirdly, some of these shares might have different voting rights um, than, the, than the ordinary shares that your angels had in your, in your previous round and even that you as a founder might have. So how do you showcase that? And then finally, one of the things that your investors are likely going to ask for is an option for expansion. So what is that? How do you model that? So those are the four kind of main points that we're going to be touching upon today. And um, yeah, with that, let's get straight into it. So I am going to share my screen. As, as, as you say frequently, Felix, all right, all right, all right. Time to get started. Right. I'm going to set the scene a little bit. So as you know, you are going out fundraising for that first institutional round. And you've been chatting to a whole lot of funds, potentially maybe Seacamp. And you've now got your round together and you, you've, you've kind of got headline terms with, with your investors. And I've just put them down here so, so we can keep referring to them. So it's going to be a 500K pound pre-seed round. And it's going to be at a, at the, the valuation that you've agreed upon with the investors is 3 million pre-money. And there's also going to be a 10% option pool that gets set up. So it's going to be 10% after the round to incentivize um, employees to join. And we'll, we'll unpack that in a little bit. Before we dive into the four main points that we've highlighted, I think it's worth just spending one minute, Carlos, on, because this is something that comes up all the time. It's a question we frequently get is early stage valuation, especially at the pre-seed round. So maybe, Carlos, if we could touch upon that 3 million, how do we get that number? Is that normal? Is it not? That's a big question. Very big question, Felix. And actually, I think I've, I've written a couple of, of blog posts around how startups get valued and you know this is like a topic that you can go on forever so we're going to try to keep it very short for this purpose because really what we're trying to do here with this cap table is more showcase you how the mechanics of a cap table work rather than like you know use this valuation but we we pick the valuation um that is helpful for the modeling purposes even though you you know you've seen quite a broad range of valuations depending on what country you're in and depending on what stage you're in one one little comment here stylistically, if you haven't watched the first episode and you're cutting straight to this one because, you know, you need to whatever, like you're really interested in, in this particular subject, um, a couple of things. You'll notice that we have all the shares on the top and we'll only have cash on the bottom. Chronologically, um, we've done a little thing here, which kind of violates the spirit of it. But we've this uh, column A and B where it says definitions, FD and ordinary share round. That's only for illustration purposes. We normally want to keep the yeah. round numbers and the round uh, sizes and money right below the angel round or the pre-seed round so that it's less confusing. So you know exactly what happened where, because what we're trying to do here is have a chronological ledger, if you will, of everything that's happened. So back on that, on that valuation point. So one of the things that typically happens with valuations is that founders are obviously sharing some of their company with investors and investors want to own some of the company, but that it has a range, right? And so if you start from the from what is obviously not going to work, it doesn't work when an investor takes 50% of your company or more at early stages. doesn't. Why? Because it's a buyout at that point. And it doesn't work if an investor gets nothing for your company because that's charity, right? So 
clearly the boundaries are between zero and 50%. And now if you look at the movement of that range over the years, it's gotten narrower and tighter, narrower and tighter, and tends to be somewhere between on the low end, somewhere between like 10% on the high end to like 25% ownership stake, an investor giving you money for whatever it is that the seed round is, it tends to be in that range. So, you know, it's like a bell curve, right? And in that bell curve, there's usually something in the in the sort of top. And in that top, for for pre-seed, you know, that that range is anywhere between like a million on the low end to, you know, maybe about four, four or five million on the top end for pre-seed, right? Now, the, re- the reality is that it's a lot tighter than that. And that tightness is around that three, three to two, three million for pre-seed. Seed has has increasingly gotten bigger and bigger. You know, whether that gets redefined to something else, we'll 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 see. But seed has migrated upwards, but it's the same dynamic. It's how much ownership the, the investor gets for that um an investment that they're giving you. And it tends to be in that range of somewhere between 15% to 25% for seed. And that continues onwards for series A and B and C. Although for A, B, and C, that ownership stake gets smaller and smaller as the risk in investing your company gets less and less. So that's just a very gen- very general definition of why um, valuation ranges are what they are. We're not recommending this specific valuation, we're just saying that for illustration purposes, it's helpful so that you can make sense why the dilution numbers end up where they are. Back to you, yeah. Felix. Awesome. Thanks, Carlos. And just for context, we will put some um, links in the show notes to the blog post that Carlos wrote and, and some material you can like elaborate on that. But no, thanks, Carlos. Super helpful. Cool. So first point that let's get straight to the first point that um, we talked about. So pro rata, your existing angels want to do their pro rata. What is that and how do you talk about it? Very simply, the pro rata is, it's a right that is given to an investor, which allows them to participate in subsequent funding rounds to maintain their percentage ownership. If you'll recall in this angel round from the last episode, investor one had put in 100,000 pounds, they had landed up with 6.06%. If there'd been this new pre-seed round that happens and they didn't take part, that percentage ownership is going to get diluted a little bit. So the pro rata amount is essentially, as investor one, like what must I put in to make up for that dilution and be at 6.06% after the round? And so that's all it is. And the the way you calculate it is simply you take the size of the round that's about to happen. So in this case, it's it's 500,000. And you multiply that by the, um, the equity holding that that investor was on pre the round. So that's... That's literally all it is. So here you can see that for investor one to maintain that percentage ownership, they have to put in an extra 30,303 pounds. So we're, for, this, for the case of this example, we're just going to assume that um, all your three existing investors are going to want to do their parata. So that's, that's all that is. Um, now you're bringing on two new investors, right? So let's, let's say one is going to be a fund um, that's going to put in, let's say, 250,000 pounds. Right. And then the other investor is going to just make up the difference of the round. So um, that's just going to be minus the sum of left to left. Cool. So that's going to be your pre seed round kind of composition. You've got your five investors, your three investors, your three existing investors are following on with their parata, and your two new investors are each putting in this amount. Um, cool. So that's that's pro rata done. Then the next point that we wanted to touch upon was kind of different investors might ask for different types of shares. So very simply, there's usually going to be a difference between the shares that you give out in a VC-led round to the ones that you as a founder might own or the ones that your existing angels might, might have had. And normally that difference manifests itself in certain in, in those shares having certain rights. So for example, that could be information rights or it could be liquidation preferences. These all really just vary on a case-by-case basis and it's kind of between you and the investor to, to decide on what those rights are. Um, and that's all going to be kind of in the term sheets that, that, that you have. I think thankfully in, in Europe at least, um, these kind of rights are relatively standardized and you don't necessarily have, um, I, I'd say for the most part, very founder unfriendly rights have been on, on the whole kind of eradicated from the ecosystem. So for example, you're not really gonna see participating preferred shares, kind of like double, di- double dipping um, liquidation preferences and, and stuff like that. 
And really, the, the reason we're bringing this up is it's just for you to be aware that different shares get given out at different rounds. And so you can see here in the columns, we've actually called it series seed shares. Then in your angel round, let's call it angel round shares, depending on what they are. Let's say you, um, as the founders, you've got ordinary shares. Imagine a situation where you just said shares, shares, and shares. Very quickly, you're probably going to land up in a situation after a couple of funding rounds where you're not actually going to know who's got what shares, why they're important, who's got what kind of rights, et cetera. So it's just a kind of, again, stylistic thing to make it super clear for you as to who owns what. So I just um, want, to, I want to comment on a couple of those points since we, we've covered very lots of very important ground very quickly, Felix. Um, a, a few things. First of all, with regards to pro rata, um, you know, in the UK, the, the pro rata is, is generally something that is considered to be statutory within um, the investor base of ordinary shareholders, although that's changed quite a bit recently in the way that it's perceived in that similar to the US, you know, pro rata isn't is, is something that founders to some extent can can choose to allocate to investors. You know, it's with 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 new investors coming on board and new investors wanting a certain ownership, the the founder ends up playing a certain role where they're helping craft what that cap, cap table looks like and um, giving an effect uh, pro rata to existing shareholders even if they've asked for it. And, and that can also extend into giving more than pro rata, which is called a super pro rata, as, as the name would imply. And, and so pro ratas now are a privilege in many ways uh, for existing investors and, and um, people who've backed the company over the journey as a way of staying in the journey of the, of the company. And it's not unusual to have um, one of two things happen. It's not unusual to have either investors, for example, early angels, who can no longer fulfill their pro rata, and therefore that pro rata can be given to somebody else, or um, a situation where there's a new investor who's who, for whatever reason, wants more of the round, and there is not enough room for the pro rata, and then the founders put in a position where they have to make a decision about who gets pro rata and who doesn't get pro rata, or what percentage of pro rata everyone is is um, equally affected by. And so these are all dynamics. We're not going to go into like what's recommended because at the end of the day, there is no normal there. It's just a trade-off. It's a series of trade-offs around this issue of pro rata. So expect that as, as your company successfully continues to raise and, and is doing really well, that will continually be a, a, a subject of soreness for you as you have to navigate all these people's interests. Now, when it comes to the, the second point, which has to do with the different attributes of shares, you know, don't panic with, with this idea that different shares come with different rights. It's not unheard of. It's not unusual. Think about it this way. If somebody's giving you a million, two million, three million, it's not unusual for them to want to know that, for example, you're going to give uh, 15% of your option pool or 15% of the company away to somebody else without consulting them first. That would seem like a kind of a considerate thing to do, right? And so it's not unusual that these shares come with certain rights. And also, you know, you want to you want to be consulted as an investor if you're going to sell the company tomorrow, you know, at the same price that you invested in, you know? And so these things, um, these rights exist, not necessarily, don't look at them with a certain level of cynicism and don't look at these different share classes with cynicism or, or, or paranoia. It's just read the terms and make sure that they make sense for where you are, but it's not unusual. And that's why they exist as a separate class from, let's say, ordinary shares where, you know, the company was brand new and there was less likely a need to have somebody who gave you 5,000 pounds to, to be involved. You know, it's a very different thing to invest 5,000 versus 1.5 million. So, you know, keep that in mind as to why those two, two different types of, of shares or three or four or five different types of shares exist and why it's important to like visually represent them differently, because as we'll see shortly, it can affect certain decisions. And so just to kind of show you once again how you actually model that, we, we did cover this in the first round, so I'm not going to explain too long, but you essentially just take, obviously, the, the amount that each investor is putting in in that round, and you divide it by the price per share. And because, obviously, you can't have um, fractional shares, you have to round that down to zero. Right? And um, here, we're just going to send for all of them and pull them down. And while Felix is doing that, while Felix is doing that, and you're wondering why round down, why not round up? Well, it's you're not going to give people free shares, are you? So round down it is. So that's that was the, the second point on the different types of shares. And now related to that, and 
Carlos, I'm also going to ask you to maybe walk us through the voting shares and kind of why that's important, what they are, why we're bringing it up here, and also why we visually represent them the way we're doing so over here. When I'm feeling lazy and I'm just making cap tables, I usually exclude the voting shares and voting percentage because for the most part, it's not really necessary. But I felt, you know, like when when I had to build these models out and, and you wanted to make sure that you were accurately representing the terms, the voting voting percentages and voting shares matters for, for various reasons, and especially when you look at the terms of some of the investment rounds that you receive. So, for example, it's it's pretty generally accepted that option pool holders don't get to vote, right? Like it, it, they don't even, they're holding an option to buy shares and not actually owning shares. And as your option holder base grows, it, it makes sense that they're excluded from decisions. And I'm not going to go into the types of terms that require voting, but you can imagine like, for example, if there's a term in your term sheet that says that 65% of the shareholder majority is required to make a selling decision. Well, then that needs to exclude visually the, the option pool shareholders. So it's easier for you to then look at your capital and be like, aha, so I have a majority just by having this person, this person, this person that adds up to my minimum shareholder ownership to get this decision approved. And so it's it's a visual reminder that your company's sort of decision-making process is separate from the ownership process, which can is mostly about when there's an exit and not necessarily around governance. So voting percentage and voting, voting shares is, is not about a specific vote as such. It's, it's not like, uh, it's, it's a rep- visual representation of the governance decisions associated with any kind of governance provisions within term sheets. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. So that's, that's the third point. And now finally onto the fourth point, which has to do with the option pool expansion. So most early stage rounds and yeah, the, the, the vast majority of them, option pools, Putting an option pool is a super common practice. And obviously that's because you need to incentivize people to join your company. And the way you're going to incentivize them to join your company is by giving them stock options. So the size of the option pools can really vary, right? So for example, if you are a solo founder and you are going to be bringing on a co-founder, your option pool is probably going to be a little bit bigger than if you are um, if you have a fully fledged founding team with a really diverse skill set. Same thing with the stage at which your company's at. Like a pre-seed company is going to need a bigger option pool than a Series D company, purely because, again, it's more risky. You have to incentivize people to join with more kind of stock options. So we're not really going to kind of go into what that ideal option pool could look like because it it really really depends. Um, But we just want to show you how it's modeled because regardless of the size of the option pool, the way in which you model it is always going to it's always going to be the same. Now, in this example, we're also going to assume that the option pool gets put in pre the round happening, right? So it comes out of the pre-money. And that's really common for, um, for seed stage financing that are led by institutional funds. And obviously, there is also an option to put it kind of after the round. Again, that's kind of between you and the investor. But just for the purposes of this example, we're going to assume that it comes out of the, of the it gets put in pre the money coming in. I want to touch on that point, Felix, because I think it's a point of a lot of confusion. I think sometimes it's misrepresented that it's like more founder friendly one way or more founder friendly. It's all math. And I think that that's like anything that plays with that is just marketing. Like it literally is just math. Like if somebody says to you, okay, I'm going to do the option pool post money, but then they also have like a certain ownership target. All they're doing is compressing other people that are participating in the round in order to achieve the ownership stake they want while at the same time having the option pool post money. So, you know, like you can't, you can't expand something without compressing something else. The two things have to happen. So the, the cleanest way is, you know, it, the, the, the reason why a lot of investors have adopted this way, the pre-money is that you, you can see what the impact is post money and everybody represents it. Otherwise we end up having is people having to, play math and compressing other people in the round in order for them to be able to get what they want approved, which then creates friction between people are coming in and then you end up having fighting before the round even closes. Now, is does that mean that you know one or another is better? No, like it is a conversation to have with investors. 
the standard and the reason why we're focusing on this particular video um, on what is standard is because 99% of the rounds are with option pool pre-money. And part of the rationale is, you know what, this money is going to get you to a certain level of success, right? And in order for you to achieve that level of success, in, in order for you to fundraise again, you will need a whole team. And so basically, it's as if you had hired that whole team. Think about it that way. Like that option pool is there because it's you're investing in a full team to execute that. And yes, you don't have those people yet, but that option pool there represents kind of what they would be like if they were already hired. And so that's another way of maybe thinking about why the logic of having it become pre-money. Thanks, Carlos, for the color. That's super helpful. As Carlos said at the beginning of the episode, and what, what we had touched upon in the last episode, one of the really important things from a visual perspective, is to lay everything out from left to right chronologically. And so in this case, because the option pool is getting put in, think about it literally one minute before the round happens, you put in an option pool, that means that visually on your cap table, it needs to actually be on the left-hand side of this of this kind of activity here, your, your pre seed round. And so I am just going to unhide what we sneakily hit earlier, which is the option pool activity, right? So think about it. Yeah, I mean, literally the easiest way to think about it is one minute before your pre-seed round gets actually done, you have an option pool that gets set up. And remember that with the investors, you can come to an agreement that there would be a 10% option pool in total at the end of the round, right? And if you see here, you'll probably remember that from the, the first episode, we had already set up one option pool and it was we had 2% um, allocated for, for in that option pool. Then the angel round happened, so it got diluted to 1.82%. And now, if there had been no option pool, um, the pre seed round would have diluted it to 1.56%, right? So here you can see that we're short by this number here, which is 10 minus that 1.56, which is we're short of an option pool of 8.44% post the round, right? Another thing that you'll probably see is that we've got an actual line here that is for option pool plus plus, which isn't the same as option pool. That's not to say that it's a different option pool. This is purely for modeling purposes, right? And the, the reason we do that is because if you had put all your option pool, so your initial option pool that, that was made in one line, and then every time that you want to re-add or expand that option pool, you're going to have, it's just going to be one super long formula within those bars. So it just actually just gets confusing. And you're also not going to visually see, okay, when did this expansion happen and what round was that um, kind of related to, et cetera. So we normally just recommend to founders to actually, it's helpful to put it as its own line item. So each expansion, you can very clearly see where, what's that, what that's related to and, and kind of where that comes in. Also, Felix, another thing that's not unusual, but I mean, it, it varies in the US versus the UK, but generally speaking, it's not unusual to have the price per share granted to um, option holders vary on on a yearly basis yeah. in the U in the USA, but in, in the UK it can affect the way that a, um, a company's value has changed. So it's not necessarily uh, unusual to also have like let's say a new group of option holders have a different um, strike price than the ones who came in earlier. So it's not necessarily a bad visual reminder that perhaps like this group will have a different strike price than this oh. other group. But um, to to your point. It's mostly for modeling purposes. It's there so that you can then quantify what the gap is between the target 10% and where you are. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought up um, price per share, Carlos, because that's another thing that's, that's really important to just flag here. So as you would remember from the last episode, your price per share is your pre-money valuation divided by the total number of shares pre the round, right? And now because your option pool is coming in literally one minute before the round, this kind of formula as, as it stands right now is slightly out of date. It should be your pre-money divided by this number over here, which is column J to one. And the reason that's important is because even though right now there's no difference, when we put in the option pool, this they're going to be shares that are issued. And so the total share count is going to go up, which means that your price per share is going to go down, right? So just a... a yeah, definitely keep that in mind that your price per share has to get adjusted and make sure that it's always the total number of shares literally just pre the round. And the same thing goes actually for the pro rata in the sense that here we are timesing the round size by 
the percentage equity that the that the investors had at the end around, but that's not actually going to be the latest round, the, the latest percentage that they're on. It's actually going to be this one, and that's going to go down slightly when the option pool is made. It's a good debugging point, Felix, because yeah. it's not unusual that when you make a cap table, especially when we get to the magic part of it in a second, where it becomes an iterative function, you will flag up errors, and then you'll wonder where those errors are. And so, it, it, when when the cap table was collapsed in the beginning of this episode, there was a very a clear sequence of events, right? You had your first round, then you had your angel round, then you had your pre-seed round, and there was no additional option. And just to reiterate the point Felix made, one of the things that we covered in the first episode is that cap tables are amazing at showcasing chronological order if you've set them up this way, where you go from left to right, you know what's happening. And so an option pool expansion pre-money literally is chronologically pre the new money. And therefore that's why there's this little wedge and this wedge means that you need to recalculate everything that we covered in the first episode and in this beginning of this episode with this new amendment, which is why um, Felix is migrating the price per share from the previous one to this one and the proratas from the previous timestamp to this timestamp. So that's why if you were ever caught out that something doesn't check, make sure that you've linked the, the total share at uh, column J here, as you can see. Uh, J21, cell J21, that you've linked that to the price per share and that you've done the right pro rata calculations on column K for all the new investors that are coming in and the existing investors. So, so now the thinking is, I need to land up over here with a number that is 8.44%, such that in total, the option pool is going to be 10%, right? So when you're creating that, this number here is going to be slightly bigger. So it's like, what can I create now that after the round happens will land up at 8.44%? So the formula that you, that you use is, again, you're rounding down um, and you are timesing that amount that you're short on by the total number of shares at the end of the round. And so again, just a quick point, this is often a mistake that we see founders make. It's like you timesing, the, it's a small mistake, but just timesing by the wrong number of shares. You round it down to the nearest zero, because again, you can't have fractional shares and go on if shares with three. And there you have it. So now, now you can see that's 8.6, that's 1.4. There's some magic here, Felix, that, that you're covering up. And, and actually you, you, were, you were kind to the audience by, by, by leaving iterative calculations on. So if you don't have iterative calculations on, you probably tried this and it all blew up. And you're probably wondering why it blew up. So if you if you look back at what we just did, we are taking something that has yet to happen, multiplying it by something that already happened, and it gives you a magic number. And the only way that that works is because Excel and Google Sheets, which we'll show you later, in the background is going through a series of iteration calculations to get you to the perfect number. There is a manual way of doing the same thing, which is that you can literally just type in 120,000, you know, and 121,000, 122,000, and then it'll triangulate to the number you want. But the reason why it's worked out perfectly is because of Excel doing the math on the background 100 times for you. And maybe it's worth now showcasing where to fix that, um, Felix, in case somebody gets that error. Yeah. So in, in Google Sheets, you'll see, and we'll put this again in, in the show notes. In Google Sheets, it's, it's just a, a small trick that you go into file, then spreadsheet, uh, file, then spreadsheet settings, then you go into the calculation tab and you have to turn on your iterative calculations. And as Carlos was saying, all that's essentially doing is it's working out if the formulas that have circular references are resolved by iterative calculation, which in this case they are. Yeah, so and since we're in Excel, maybe it's worth showing it on Excel, Felix, where it is as well. Just in prefer, it's in the same. It's in kind of in the same tree. It's in preferences. Uh, there, preferences, preferences. Uh, there you go, and there you go. It sees where it says calculation formulas and lists. Second, the second uh, row, the second row, the little calculator. Uh, uh, calculation. There you go, and then you see where it says use iterative calculation. It's a little check mark there. If that check mark is off, you're probably going to get errors. If it's on. You're probably going to actually you know what, just for, for fun, let's turn it off, Felix, so people can see what it looks like when you turn it off. And then they yeah, close that window. And so, ah, look what happened. Oh, it broke. This is what you'll see. But the magic here, I mean, this, this part is the, the part that I find really fun is 
basically you're telling the model, hey, look, tell me what I need now to get to the target amount later, even though I have no idea how these things connect. So that's why it gives you that error. But the the conclusion is, if if you turn it back on, Felix, just so that we can add it up, is that if you add up the the two option pools, it should add up to the ten percent. Yeah. Yeah. So here you can see that if you sum everything up, so you can find you sum up the founder position, you sum up the uh, investor position, and you sum up the total option pool position. That's a pretty healthy looking cap table to go out and, and into your next round, which is going to likely be a big institutional seed round anywhere between two, three, four, five million. So that's really, that's really it. Um, so Carlos, thanks so much again for, for joining me. And the next episode that we're going to be doing is actually going to have A, a very special guest, and B, it's going to be on all things safes, convertibles, ASAs, um, kind of like post money uh, caps, et cetera. So stay tuned for that. Yeah. And Carlos, yeah, thanks again for joining me. No, thanks, Felix. I, I'm, I'm just going to add one, one little point there is that, you know, we've, we've really enjoyed creating this series. As you can tell, um, it's a lot of fun. We love cap tables. And, you know, if, if you're going to have to watch this video several times, um, you know, feel free on the YouTube channel to post question marks and we'll, we'll, we'll try to answer them. If you have any, any questions about anything that we did here, we'll be posting the models, both the Google Sheet one and this one, so you can play with them. But I think the key thing that we're going to be covering in the third episode uh, that Felix mentioned is, is how non-equity behaves, right? How non-equity behaves. And if you haven't watched um, any of the cap table or any of the legal structure talks with Tom, um, I highly recommend you take an opportunity to watch the legal hour episodes with Tom Wilson and I that will help set the context for the structures that we're going to cover at the next one. So thanks again, Felix, for, for hosting. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Next time. Bye.